And hello everyone and welcome to this in the, this, I don't know what number this is, maybe 10th in our <laughs> live chat series. And we are now post lockdown. So we are looking tonight at uh, outdoor play, especially through winter and then beyond. And I think that's come about because you know, we were talking about a lot of people getting outdoors through lockdown. It was in kind of some quite a lot milder weather. And then now we are just starting to get hit with some of that winter, colder weather that can put people off. And we really want to just reflect back on that time um, in lockdown and how amazing that was for our mental health and overall well-being and how we can bring those habits or those new experiences forward with us you know and reflection is a really big part of that because you know, if we don't reflect we don't learn we don't gain that insight then we can't implement changes so that's what we're kind of going to be looking at tonight there's going to be lots of practical tips we are going to be looking at practical tips on how to get outdoors as a parent and as a teacher uh, and then we are also going to be covering clothing what to wear Firstly, though, let's do a bit of an introduction. So I'm stoked to have here, we've got Kirsten Simmons from Talking Tree Hill, and she's been on a couple of our live chats. So welcome, Kirsten. And we also have Michelle, who is from Outdoorsy New Zealand and runs the awesome Facebook page, Outdoorsy Mama, which um, has an amazing following and a really interactive following there as well. What we generally do is we kick off with an intro about ourselves. So um, maybe I'll start with you, Kirsten, if you want to just take a wee moment to introduce yourself and then we'll go to you, Michelle. Sure. Uh, ko Kirsten Toko Ingoa. Uh, ko Waiheke Tomotu. Um, I am from Talking Tree Hill and Talking Tree Hill is an 18 acre property on beautiful Waiheke Island, which is dedicated to having children about 90% of the time outside and we have a forest school and a bush school and a farm school and we teach yoga and meditation and art and music. We sort of have eight different strands um, that we combine into one to create one day schools that we have here, one day schools that we have in schools and we do after school programs and we also do holiday programs and so Talking Tree Hill is set up as a alternative kind of education stream to what's happening in mainstream but it's also set up as a complementary one so at the moment we're doing really exciting things um, in terms of research and progress into getting lots more of the outdoors in classrooms so that's us <laughs> fantastic thank you kirsten over to you michelle yeah, hi everybody. Um, I'm Michelle from Outdoors EMZ. Um, I'm based in Auckland, but I really I split my time between Auckland and Tutakaka up in Northland, which is um, really home for us. I've got two little boys who are seven and three, and they are pretty full on. And um, just after I had my seven-year-old, I really realised um, how much it really grounded me. Uh, being outdoors and just totally recharged me and improved my mental health and well-being as a parent um, and it was also um, just so much more calming for my son when he was outdoors as well I just noticed you know the behavior and his equilibrium was just so much better as well so I started getting out for as many little adventures with him as I could and um, lots of my friends started noticing going, oh my gosh you always do it going out and doing all this cool stuff um, how do you do it and how do you know where to go and what to do and how do you know what gear to take and you know, how do you have the confidence to do it on your own? Because I was doing it mostly on my own because my husband's got a really full on job and um, he wasn't going to be around a lot of the time. So I decided quite early on, I wasn't just going to be sitting around at home waiting for him to be available. Or I was just going to go and do it. So um, yeah, I started out writing a blog and then that developed into a business. Um, I've got a really active Facebook group called the Outdoorsy Mama. Um, and there's well over 3,100 mums in there now, which is really cool. It's a great space to find tips and ideas and motivation and inspiration um, for things to do outdoors, both um, whether it's on your own as a mum or with other friends um, who like to get outdoors as well or with your children. So those are the kind of three strands that we cover. And um, yeah, so I run a membership with a calendar of events that's based out of Auckland that you can choose from if you want to be a member. Um, but the Facebook group is free and um, I'm also developing a program for corporate health and wellbeing to try and help um, mums who've got busy corporate jobs to fit more of the outdoors in because it's really hard to prioritise your time, I know. 
Totally. Hey, awesome. That sounds great. Thank you both. That's brilliant. Uh, I'll do a quick intro as well. So kia ora, I am Celia Hogan and I am founder of Little Kiwis Nature Play. And I guess um, I'm, a, I'm a big advocate for outdoor nature play, risky play, building resilience uh, and and through that, it naturally morphs into improving mental health and overall well-being. So those are kind of the key areas I'm advocating for. And how I advocate for that is through advocating. But also, I run <laughs> professional development training programs for teachers and parents. Um, and, and that's been going really well over the last couple of years and building up. Yeah, building up quite a cool following as well. And lots of support nationally just for that whole nature education movement. So I'm pretty proud to be involved in that. Uh, I also do a bit of speaking and I have a bush kindy, which is for preschoolers and their whanau. And that is really cool. And we uh, actually started back today post lockdown. So today was our first day back at our, um, our nature play group. And that was really exciting to have little tamariki cruising around, falling over in the, in the long grass and rolling around in the wet. It was just really cool to, to be having that part of my life again. So that's me in a nutshell. Um, we've got lots of people watching from all over New Zealand and, um, you know, Christchurch, we've got in the Cargill, Timaru, and I've also seen that we've got um, Narell from Melbourne, Australia. So welcome, Australia. That is fantastic to have you with us. I did ask a question earlier on, um, just describe in one word, or well, a couple if you need to, but one word, you know, what your lockdown time, you know, what's the word to describe your lockdown time? So one or two words to describe your lockdown time, and share that in the chats, and we are going to get started. We are starting with a bit of a reflection, so we want to just have a look at, um, looking back at lockdown and what that taught us about you know, outdoor play, because that kind of frames us looking forward to winter. And I mentioned before that it, it's a bit about when we reflect, we're able to then gain insights and learnings from that reflection that we can then apply to going forward. But if we're not reflecting, then we might not be getting all the learning. So we're going to have a quick reflection. And I'm going to, maybe I'll start with Kirsten first for this. And just thinking about from either your perspective, what you noticed um, in that kind of out lockdown period, as far as outdoor time goes, or maybe conversations that you had with other people. So take it away, Kirsten. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Celia. Um, I think I'll talk a little bit about both. On my own reflection, outdoor time was a necessity. It was kind of like a, a non-negotiable. It was that, you know, we were allowed to walk so we could actually get outside past our you know, driveway and, and notice the things around us. Um, it was a really important time because it was a time if I was going for a run myself, that it would be my calming time to kind of get my mind and my body working together. But it was also a beautiful time for getting the children out, either both of us, you know, like I had two boys, Zach and Leo, with, whether they were both with me or I was just one of them. So it meant that we could, really develop more of our own relationship and connection and those kind of things. And it just, it was just so obvious that it, we all needed to get outside. And that we're really lucky because we have such a big outdoor space here, but the boys also wanted to be able to venture further away. And we really didn't leave the property much, but we could go down and Leo has a little friend down the road that, you know, he, they waved to and, and at nighttime we did like Morse code. Um, on, a, on, a, on a light and things like that. So it meant that we could keep relationships going that just went on Zoom, um, you know, that we could get out. And we, we, we thought of different activities, you know, like, you know, our neighbor texted us to do that Morse code thing. And I was like, I would never have thought of that. That's brilliant. And we waited up at night and we did that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it, for us and for the other people that I was talking to, you just got that real appreciation of, of the sounds of nature. You could hear a lot more again. We wanted to play outside a lot more because it, it was fresh and it was, it was one space that you could get to out, outside of your house. You couldn't go anywhere else, right? So you yeah. could go for a walk or you could do, you know, any activities that meant that you could kind of get rid of a bit of physical uh, energy. And for us, it was um, such a great time of reflection in that, in that as well. And that time to recalibrate and also to, you know, like, 
we put in another garden. So we actually had time to do things like growing and getting the tunnel house. The peacocks then got into that garden. So that was a bit of a bugger. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but for us, if I'm you know, thinking about how we found it, we found that we got to spend more time outside and notice the reasons for the seasons as well. Um, and as a family to connect, I think that's the big things. And, and that's what I heard from people as well. They could go into the the green spaces that they were at. They could see what was there when other times they might've just been rushing past it to go from A to B. Yeah. So yeah, when I think about that, I guess my word is it was necessity for many people. It was there out, you know, mm. the outside, it makes sense, doesn't it? So yeah, would, that, that's what I would think um, yeah, just cool. in a really small way of saying that. Yeah. Yeah, that's great personal reflection. And and Michelle, what about for you or for what you noticed with with other people? What what's your reflection on that time? Um, it was a really um, quite a precious time for us, to be honest. Um, I was really grateful and appreciative that it was in autumn because it's one of my mm. favourite times of the year. And um, we were up at Tutakaka and um, that was one thing that we really enjoyed over that eight week period was seeing all the change happen. Um, there's yeah. one tree in particular that I just love watching change at that time every year. And it's just kind of at the start of a little bushwalk that starts just down the road from us and um it's one of those kind of maple conquer trees and when mm. we first arrived it's most of its leaves were green but some of the outside were just starting to get a little tinge of red and then by the time we left at the end of the um the eight week period half the leaves were gone and it was a gorgeous you know all those fiery colors and then with the little if you walked in the afternoon you could see that with the silhouette of the sun going down behind it, all the conkers kind of those prickly things all, all in silhouette between all these fiery leaves and it's just stunning so beautiful yeah. so the boys and I enjoyed um, doing that particular walk every week and just watching to see how much the tree had changed um, we also enjoyed finding other little ways to spend more time outdoors um, mm. at first I don't know at the very beginning of the lockdown um, I was a little bit I wanted to be a wee bit careful because I know that they said you're only supposed to kind of go out for exercise, you know, for a walk around the block kind of thing. Mm. But um, we're lucky that where we were at Tutakaka, we had got quite a few spaces where um, there's little kind of um, nature trails or little bushwalks quite close to our house, which you really you hardly ever see anybody else on. So I didn't find it too much of a stretch to pack a backpack with some storybooks and blankets and, and snacks and things yeah. and actually go and veg out in, in that, Nico, that particular Nico Grove for, um, you know, a good hour of story time outdoors yeah. and um and things like that um and then just other little things like you know when we're down at the beach we spent um most part of a morning drawing an aquarium in the sand all the, cool. the kids had sticks and um we all drew we drew crazy fish the craziest fish that you could think of and that kind of thing so we just yeah because um because we had more time um, when we were outdoors, we could just go with our imaginations and do what we felt yeah. like. But also because I was thinking to myself, I don't just want to go for a walk and then go back to the house <laughs> because it's yeah. another day of being at the house. I was, so I was trying to think of things, little activities we could do that would occupy a bit more time yeah. and um, put off the inevitable, I'm hungry, I want to go home now, you know, um, kind of thing. Um, yeah, so those those are some of the things that we did. We did a couple of bigger expeditions as well, especially as the levels moved down. Yeah. Um, and I felt happier about being outdoors um, for most of the day, which was great. Yeah. And it was good when we could swim again as well, because we were lucky up north. Um, I'm sure you were too, Kirsten, in, in Waiheke. The mm. weather, it, it was really mild, and, um, and we could still swim and that, that kind of thing. So that was pretty awesome. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And we've got lots of people coming in the comments as well. I'll read out a couple of those. Um, so some descriptive words, revitalising, preparing outdoor space for winter, juggling commitments, awesome family time, strained at time, definitely. And I think mm. um, that that is another side of this, I think. Mm. Um, that, that, yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah, Ingrid said strained. Uh, embracing the moment. The old saying, had time to stop and smell the roses, definitely. And taking things slowly, nowhere to be, so take time to explore more. And I think that's it, and it really links into, um, so I'm just going to briefly talk about like the community. So we live right on the edge of the Port Hills, 
and the city. So on one side we have um, native reserve and farmland and then the other side we have the city. And what I really noticed was just people really exploring their neighbourhoods, people getting mm. out and going to places that are literally within walking distance of their house and they'd never been there before. So the time gave people an opportunity to get to know their neighbourhood, their local environment. Um, and I think it also brought in a bit of a real, a bit of a community feel. I felt quite a lot safer at that time when there were so many mm. people out people were being intentionally friendly and, and conscious and aware of that, of, of mm. communicating to people. Um, and I think that's really precious as well from, from that outdoor experience. But it's that connection into the next section we're going to talk about. And we'll only talk about this really briefly, just so I want to give yeah. as much time for tips, but just looking at the um, how, you know, how are people spending their time connecting to their local environment? Because it's actually a really important part of, um, of creating that relationship with nature is spending time in our local spaces. Because when we spend time in our local spaces regularly, we learn to love it and we learn to care for it and become the future kaitiakitanga of that place or the future guardians of that place. And that is really what I saw happening in, in our city environment people got noticing you guys both talked about noticing what's happening mm. in nature and people were noticing what's happening in their local environment so um let's have a, a quick maybe one minute each on what was my question it was going to be you know how were people spending their time in those local spaces and what are the benefits of connecting with their local environment so should, michelle do we want to start with you this time so what are those benefits of connecting with local spaces and how are people spending that time? So just a real quick sum up from you. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed seeing um, other families and other kids out on the beach. And like you said, um, like on purpose, everybody would make eye contact and smile and, and talk to each other. And even though we had to, you know, keep our two meter distance from other people and, and things, um, everybody would still be calling out greetings and, and things like that, which was really cool. Um, and I, yeah, I think it's just what you were saying about kaitiakitanga, that's just it's such an important concept. And I think that the lockdown was a really good opportunity for our children to start to realize more that they are, are actually you know um, they are actually guardians of what is around them and I did see a couple of families out there with rubbish bags going for a walk along the road and picking up rubbish along the side of the road oh. and um, when whenever we go to the beach or um, go for a, a bit of a um, mission around the rocks because we love going around the rocks at low tide we always take um, a little receptacle with us to pick up any old fishing line or anything like that oh. but um, um, yeah I just I, 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 I th especially when I saw that family along the side of the road, because we do that sometimes, but I haven't actually ever seen anyone else doing it yeah. <laughs> in our neighbourhood. I know that once a year, some, one of the local restaurants actually organises a community roadside cleanup. But um, I just thought, yeah, that was really neat and it was really good to see. Yeah, cool. And uh, Kirsten? I yeah, I think. Yeah, I think for me, it was just that we were engaging as a community and giving back without actually all being together. Exactly what you were saying, Michelle, was was the point that I was going to make is that things were cleaner. Like there just wasn't as much rubbish around. And if there was, people were picking up like, I mean, I can never walk past rubbish anyway. But um, it felt like the pe people really got the benefits of connecting to your local environment and thinking about respecting it. And I think actually children really do naturally do that. I mean, they love nature before they have to protect her. But I think the adult capacity really came in. Um, and I think that was a nice shift as well. So yeah. for me, the one thing that I wanted to say around that was that I just found things so much cleaner, so much um, uh, quieter. And there was a we, I think we developed a, an appreciation in those spaces of community, community and linkage to the land, you know, those really important relationships mm -hmm. around that. And I think that became really, um, yeah, we're really aware of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One and cool I think thing actually that we had, um, sorry, um, Celia, um, through homeschooling my seven year old, well, he, he was six at the time, he's just turned seven, but one of their um, study topics was, um, was birds. 
And so they had all of these things that they could choose from, all these different activities one week that they could do um, to do with birds in their neighbourhood. And I just thought that was so cool. So um, my son and I sat down and wrote a, a really big list of all the birds that we had in our garden or that we've ever seen. And we had a, a list of native birds and then a list of the introduced species and it actually oh. blew me away when we sat down and wrote them all yeah. out how many there were and yeah. um yeah and Nate was pretty amazed as well and so that was that's just another way for him to realize what a special place it is and yeah. that it's mm. we're not the only ones who live here so you know it's not cool um for us to just stuff it up yeah and as adults and as well intimate. that's really cool yes. as an adult to notice that yeah and yeah. I think that's, a, that's that key thing coming through this conversation and, excuse me, <clears throat> previous ones as well, is that slowing down has enabled us to really reconnect with not only ourselves, but our, our environment. And through the slowing down, it's been a lot of walking and biking in our neighbourhood neighborhoods, which was swapped out for the car. When you're in a car, mm. you don't see all this stuff. You don't notice it. You don't smell it. You don't hear it. So, so that's been a really big shift. And I think th that's definitely a tip. <laughs> you know, yeah. You've, you've yeah. got to get out and walk and bike in your neighbourhoods to be able to notice and yep. connect and then you with have, your environment. Yeah, and, you have, and also to connect with each other because we mm. had a lot more conversations. When you're yeah. just walking down the road, you've got much more time to talk to each other about what you're observing and to ask questions about... Um, which way, which direction do you think east is from here, or th yeah. things like that? You know, just using the sun and, and teaching the kids all those kinds of things, and mm. making observ observations about the weather and, and stuff yeah. like that. It's just, yeah, it's cool. It, it, um, your kids just um, their natural curiosity takes over, and you've actually got time to talk about all this stuff. Totally. So it's nature mm. connection and human connection coming together. It's fantastic. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, well, I think that leads us nicely into our, it's kind of, I'll call it our tips section. Um, and we are thinking about those learnings and those reflections from lockdown and just outdoor time. And we are going to offer up some tips and ideas on how to um, carry those on, carry out, carry on that outdoor time, especially through winter. Because I think winter yeah. is a harder time to get outside and we can easily just go, oh, no, I'll just stay here inside in front of my fire and stay warm. But um, this is hopefully going to give you some ideas for both parents and teachers on how to keep getting outdoors over the winter months. So we'll start with some tips. We'll go around the circle a couple of times and then we're going to move into clothing at the end. Mm -hmm. So Kirsten, do you want to take us away with your first top tip for getting outdoors this winter? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think you need to make outdoor time non-seasonal. So that's my first tip, that it's you do it every season. So I, there's tips we'll give it to you about winter, but actually if you reframe your mind and say, this is actually just a habit that we do and that we spend uh, one hour to three hours a day outside and you create that habit. Now, we will talk more about the clothes that you need to wear and all those kind of things. But I think if we start with, and I, as Celia knows, I often start with mindset. If you change your mindset and change your habits to go, do you know what? This is just what we do. So you continue yeah. that. But when you come back, yes, you can warm yourself against the fire. You can have a marshmallow you know, at the fire or you do it while you're outside. So that would be my first tip. And then my second thing is, is plan your time. So you make sure that you put that in. You allocate time every day. Or you plan a hike where you're connecting with Michelle, with the mums, and she takes you <laughs> off on a hike or something along those lines. But you organize that this is just a natural rhythm to our week and that, you know, we might choose a hike or we might um, tune into something uh, that's new for us that we've never done before, an exciting outdoor adventure or you know, we know every Saturday we're all, we can be outside. Well, I am with the boys. They all play rugby. So that's what we do. But you make sure that it is just part of your plan. And when you're out there, you notice what's happening with the weather. So when you notice what's happening with the weather, you take things on the walk that you need. You make sure that you've got gumboots on, that you've got tools that you can take with you. You have a magnifying glass that you can sort and classify beautiful things like as Michelle said autumn was just amazing for that you think about what you're looking for and you collect it so you take the outside back into the inside 
So you get lots of different things and then you bring it back and you create activities. Um, and I'll pass this on to Michelle or Celia now because I know we're going around the circle, but that's just kind of three or four ideas for a start that what we can do. Cool. Go, yeah. Michelle. That's brilliant. Sure. As always. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, yeah, I like you, Kirsten. I love the idea of bringing the outdoors in and mm. um, and having little collections of things. You know, whether it's driftwood that you can just kind of put on the coffee table, or a little collection of rocks or sticks. <laughs> My boys just we always seem to come home with tons of sticks um, and and things like that. So yeah. Um, Take, make sure that you take some kind of receptacle or bag or something along to, to carry your treasures home and then you can either do a crafty, arty thing. I'm, I'm not the world's craftiest person, but um, there's all sorts of stuff online, inspiration, mm. or just see what your kids can come up with making a, any kind of sculpture or um, just tell them to see if they can come up, make an animal shape out of what they've brought back or that kind of thing. Um, I guess my top tip really is be prepared and um, that like you Kirsten that that stands for all the seasons um I just about will always have some kind of um flexi tub or something in the back of my car just with stuff stashed in it so that whenever we are <laughs> out and about going anywhere if we've got a spare 20 minutes or there's somewhere that we can stop on the way or whatever we're ready to go so I usually have a complete um change set of change of clothes for the kids in there and then I might have just a few muesli bars or something like that that's kind of like long life snacks emergency snacks down the bottom there um, I'll have a bottle of water and um, when it's winter I might have something like a, a hot water bottle or something in there and um, when I'm organized I like to take along um, a thermos of water of, of hot water and um, you can fill up the hot water bottle. So if they're getting cold, if you're going to stop for snack time or something like that, you can shove the hot water bottle up their jacket while they're sitting down to eat. If it's a really cold day or if you're out in the wind, um, I especially find that with, with little ease, as soon as they stop moving, they get cold mm -hmm. quite quickly. So they'll strip off all their layers when they're running around and tree climbing and throwing sticks or whatever it is that they're doing. But as soon as they might stop and sit down to eat, um, they do tend to get cold quite quickly. So that's when I'll chuck the, make sure they chuck the jackets back on. And if it's really cold, I'll, I'll have a hot water bottle on standby if I can. Um, and another good tip with the thermos of hot water is to put frankfurters in it and yeah, for lunch. And you, can take, yeah, you can take hot dog <laughs> rolls yeah, and just a little bit of tomato sauce or something. And then you've got yummy hot, um, your hot frankfurters and you can make um, hot dogs while you're out in the park or, on your hike or wherever you are. Little tip. Yeah, we do that skiing actually. We take um yeah the Frank is up skiing. Nice hot meal. Uh, and and as well just to add to the hot drink. So it's you know it could be hot soup, it could be um hot Milo or Raro. When I was sea kayak guiding we used to serve hot Raro. Have you guys either had hot Raro? Yeah, good. Yeah. Amazing. Nice if you yeah, haven't, yeah. if you haven't, please have it. And if you have, please comment in the chat room and tell tell everyone how good it is because it's amazing hot. Um, yeah, cool. And I'm what I'm going to do now. My top tips. I'm going to reflect this back onto teacher perspective because we do have some teachers watching um, today, and we'll be watching repeat replay. So. I think going back to that theme of kind of planning or scheduling it. So if you're an early childhood teacher, um, just ensuring that you have, um, you know, an open door policy, i.e. kids can go indoors and outdoors at any time during the day. I think that's one thing that, that you really want to look at. Um, rather than if it's drizzling or rainy or cold, the door gets shut. So just ensuring that, that it is a normal part of, your kindergarten or your early childhood, that children can go inside or outside at any time. Um, the other thing for early childhood is, um, you know, scheduling some excursions beyond the gate. So getting out into your local community, mm. to your local parks and reserves, within walking distance or local community garden. So scheduling that in. And if you're needing support with that, obviously, you know, I do help with that. Um, but we have some stuff online that, that can help support you to, to take that first step if you're needing help with that. So that's early childhood. 
primary school, I think again scheduling it. So you know, if you if this is new for you, scheduling it maybe start with one afternoon a week that your class, your children just go outside and play. You're going to have to plan for that. You're going to have to prepare the Fano for that mm. and send them some information about why you're sending them outside for the whole afternoon throughout winter and for the rest of the year. Um, and also what they're going to need clothing wise. And we will be talking about clothing, but also sourcing it because we know that, that you know, different um, socioeconomic situations, some people aren't gonna be able to afford it. Um, so we're gonna talk about that side of things as well. So, so scheduling it into your weekly routine. And again, I'm not talking about lunch times or break times, I'm talking about class time, getting them out there. Um, if you're worried about linking the curriculum, you know, there, there's lots online for that. Um, again, I can help support that as well. But it's, you know, nature, it naturally links to either the Tefariki curriculum or the New Zealand curriculum. It is, it is just amazing. So scheduling that time in. And if you can, if you're game enough, um, you know, reframing your whole school or kindy philosophy around bringing in a nature philosophy into, into that, into your purpose, your vision, um, and your values. Uh, that's really going to help because it, it does really help being a whole centre or a whole school-wide approach uh, because then everyone's on the same page as to why. Um, and just an example, um, yesterday it was pouring with rain here in Christchurch and I know my son's class, they, they head outside every afternoon, so five days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. They are outside for the afternoon and I just double-checked with the teacher, I said, oh, and, and were they outside today? And goes, yes, yes, they always get shooed out, no matter what the weather, they know the rules. And I was like, great, you know, and it's just having that confidence to, to say they will be okay, they come prepared, they have the right clothing, and they know that that's what they do uh, on those afternoons or that afternoon each week. Cool. Right, I think we've got time for another round. Um, we're, do we're doing well. So, Kirsten, do you want to take us through one more tip and then we'll go to Michelle? Yeah, I actually, I think I want to just follow on from what you were saying cool. there, Celia. I think one of my, which would be one of my, my top tips, is that if you really believe that your children should be spending time outside, um, be an advocate. So that's what I do a lot with parents and schools is that become an advocate for it. And, and you touched on the Celia. It's like, I, it's like that line, be the change you want to see. So if you really believe in this, then be that advocate, model the behavior, talk about how much it makes you feel better when you're outside, um, connect, makes your mind feel more connected, your body, you're more relaxed, you're calm, you're creative, innovative, all, all research says that those are the benefits of being outside and by being outside. So be, maybe think about what made, motivates you to get outside and then how do you want to do that? Do you want to be part of a group? Is it for self-care? Is it for thinking? Is it to be physically fit? So become the advocate, work out how it helps you so then you can help children, uh, your own children or those in the schools. You know, you can think about volunteering. And then what, what I wrote down here was that, um, you know, maybe oh, actually the other couple of things were, chat, is it a time when you go outside is when you chat to a friend or is it a time when you create a piece of art? What is it that happens? Then transfer those thoughts that you have about yourself and why you want to be outside to that of your children, whether that's you as a mum or that's you as an educator. Think about what is it that those group of children or your child really loves to do? and then take it outside, okay? So that's my top tip, top tip for that, is that think about, know your children, observe what they're about, and think, okay, can we take this and do it outside? So the schools that I've been working with, we're, like Celia's um, son's school, we have, I've now got them up to the idea of, you know, kind of having afternoons outside. Actually, the teachers came up with them themselves, and they do a full one-day school in school as well, completely outside. Cool. Every every week, every, every season. So, I mean, it comes up with that, that, that saying, isn't it? There's no such thing as bad weather, only bad clothes, right? So there's no excuse not to go outside, but really think about how you can engage your children to go outside and think about the activities that you would normally do inside, whether it's the classroom or your home, 
and take it outside. So that's all I do a lot of the time. It's not hard. So the, the real key for that top tip of mine is that become the advocate. And that means that understand how that makes you feel, how that can make your family feel better. And then at the end of the day, when you're doing all those things, the long term and the overarching theme is that you will be giving back to the environment because you'll be connecting with it. You'll be, you know, looking after it more, taking, getting a better relationship. So therefore, not only are your children the kaitiaki, but so are you. Yeah. So yeah, become the advocate. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Michelle. Yeah, that was a great tip, um, Kirsten. Thanks for that. Um, and following on from that, I think that a really good way to look at it as well um, in both getting ourselves outdoors and out, getting our children to want to be outdoors more, especially throughout winter, is you know whenever we are experiencing um, inclement weather, kind of reframing it instead of mm. like saying to your kids, oh gosh, what a yucky day, or oh, um, I don't want to do this it's just too horrible outside or you know using those kind of negative words to describe the weather mm. um try and think about positive ways that you can talk about that kind of weather um if mm. it's really blowing hard it's really windy you can say gosh i just love windy days like this you can feel the energy in the air or if it's absolutely belting down with rain you can you can talk about um the beautiful sound that it makes and how how it feels on your skin or um or um, if you can feel like it's giving you a little, um, like a fairy massage or something through your raincoat, or um, look up that gorgeous poem by Hone Tufare and read them the, that poem about mm. rain. I can hear you, what is it? I can hear you making small holes in the silence, rain. Things like that. And, and um, make it positive, a positive experience yeah. for the children. And so that mm. um, when you do say to them, hey, let's go and let's take this outside. Why, why are we doing this inside? We could go and do this outside. They're not going, oh, I don't want to. It's yucky and horrible out there. Um, yeah, try and come up with positive language around that kind of mm. weather. Yeah. Um, and um, I guess because I, I, main, I work with mums um, and trying to, to encourage them, um, it's like what you were saying, Kirsten, about modeling the behavior as well. Um, I'm a mm. pretty keen runner and I must admit sometimes um, if it's starting to get darker in the evening or dark in the morning and I'm looking out and it's raining and windy and I think, oh, I'm not sure I want to go for a run right now. If your kids see you getting out there anyway in that kind of weather and coming back and I can guarantee that when you get back you'll be glowing you'll be absolutely exhilarated with what you've just achieved the endorphins will be flowing and you will be in a better mood than before you left then your kids are going to see um, that you can actually have really good fun out there in wild weather so um, yeah that's my tip as well fantastic use positive Brilliant. language and get out there in it yourself so that your kids can see that you're having fun and then they're going to want to as well <laughs> Yeah, beautiful. And um, Kate's just said, oh, I love that poem. Yes, sounds amazing. Yeah, hey, um, yeah, so brilliant. Fantastic. Great summary there. I was just having a look at what else I wrote. And probably one other thing from a, a teacher and a parent perspective, I guess, is that when it is really cold, um, if we kind of sit still and do something that's kind of more fine motor, that is when we can get really cold. So one tip that I have for winter is if it is like one of those bitterly brisk days where you are just chilled to the bone, move. That is the tip, move. Mm. Uh, in, mm. the, you know, forest kindergartens over in Europe, you know, it'll be, you know, a foot of snow on the ground and they will be in a kindergarten setting, an outdoor kindergarten setting for the whole day. And they will often just move for the whole day. Uh, and the adults have mm. to still wear more layers, but the children are just moving that little bit more and it just helps them to keep warm. So movement is a really good way of, of helping to keep warm. Um, as is fire, you know, I think, you know, having yes. fires in the winter is, it's really beautiful. It's magical. Uh, children are so respectful of fire and it's just mm. this amazing, mm. mesmerising um, beauty that children just love and and you can really see the risk in fire and I think that's why children really connect with it so well they will just be looking and they feel the heat mm. and they can see it um so yeah and they can cook into... yummy stuff on it <laughs> exactly uh that's exactly yeah. what I was about to say that the food mm. you know 
preparing food to cook on a fire is another part of that tradition. And that can be something that parents are doing in the winter or within a school setting. Uh, and obviously, you know, there are things that you want to, to think about, but there are lots of, you know, online you can find heaps of information about how to run a fire circle, for example. Um, or you can mm -hmm. go to some form of nature education training. It's, it's once you do it, you're like, oh, why didn't I do this sooner? Um, but I do recognise that that can be scary for some people, but it is actually super rewarding. So have a think about fire. Uh, just a, a general sum up there. I think some of the key things we're looking at about, you know, mindset and role modelling are, are probably two of the ones up the, up the top there. Um, then we're looking into, you know, scheduling it in, planning that, preparing for it, so having the right equipment um, mm. ready for that. One thing I didn't say was, uh, you know, from a family perspective, we, we have a bag of outdoor gear. And so we just know where all the outdoor warm gear is for or a seasonal bags. We know where it is and we just have it ready all the time. And that's where things go back in um, once they've been washed or once we're finished with them. So just being prepared, um, organised. And that also goes for schools, you know, so making sure your parents know that they have to, um, that their children need to come with this kind of equipment. Um, the other thing that Michelle was touching on was that, you know, positive framing and, you know, so framing everything in the positive or turning things around in our mind, especially around weather, because it is super easy to go, mm. oh, it's raining, let's head back inside. So how can we reframe that? Right, we are getting close to time. So we're going to move through our top tips on clothing um kind of probably let's go bullet pointy type style just so that we can help with the timings uh kirsten since we're going around that circle do you want to start with just a couple of things to think about and we're going to be thinking about it from a children perspective and a adult perspective hit us go awesome well celia actually if you read her newsletter it has nailed all of it so I don't really need to say much. <laughs> I read that today and I thought, oh, God, that's good. Um, um, I guess for me, we all know that if we're getting wintry gears, we're going to need jackets and we're going to need over trousers and gumboots. And um, so I'm going to do different ones. But what I was thinking about is that perhaps this is a time when you and your child could learn to make a hat and a scarf together. So you could actually be knitting things that you want to use. I'm not a knitter. But um, my boys, well, Zachy can. So maybe it's something though that if they make it, they might wear it as well. Because sometimes keeping hats on children can be a bit of a nightmare. But maybe if you actually do that together, they can keep it on. Because as we spoke about um, Celia, and as people know, you lose all your what eight percent, I think it is, out of out of your head. So you need to get those hats on in winter for sure to keep yourself nice and warm. Um, and I think my second suggestion, and you girls will go a lot more into the things to get, but when you are buying things, try to avoid buying them new. So I, you know, I always think of the seed to garment process. So where does it start and where is it going to um, end? Where does it finish up? And because our byline at Talking Tree Hill is healthy children, healthy planet, that's what we're always thinking about is when you get something, how long is it going to live? And when it's, when it's lived its life, where does it go to? So I just wanted to say a couple of things around that. Um, basically avoid buying new if you can. So the fashion industry, I'm gonna just read a little statistic here, if you don't mind Celia. Go for it. Um, yeah, the fashion industry emits more carbon than international flights and maritime shipping combined. And fast fashion produces 10% of all humanity carbon emissions. And it's the second largest consumer of the world's water supply and pollutes oceans with microplastics. So you need to also think about what textile you're buying. New Zealand Merino is really good because 85% of all textiles go into the dump each year. Mm -hmm. So how long will you have your clothing for and make ethical choices is basically what I wanted to say in those, those top tips. <laughs> oh, thank you, Kirsten. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, Michelle, over to you. Yeah, well, I was definitely going to say go and um, hunt out your local hospice shop, Salvation Army store, that kind of thing. Um, for myself, I actually just took um, half a bootload of stuff. <laughs> I'm having a big clear out at the moment. 
um, yesterday and, um, oh, sorry, in the weekend, and I was amazed at some of the stuff that was there. I mean, a lot of the things are virtually brand new, have hardly even been worn. Yeah. Um, jackets and, um, and woolly vests and gumboots and things like that that children just outgrow so quickly. Um, yeah. You don't have yeah. to buy new ones, and they're a fraction of the price. Um, and also, um, my second tip is to um, just ask around in Facebook groups. That is one of the best places to, yeah. to get hand-me-downs. And um, mums, we're always trying to get rid of stuff because, you know, the kids do outgrow it so fast. And if you don't clear it all out, it just ends up piling up somewhere in your garage. And then all of a sudden, you can't even open the door to the cupboard under the stairs or whatever. So, um, yeah, get a good network going with some of the mums in, in your neighbourhood, maybe your school or whatever, and make sure that gear is getting passed around Um if you if you think if you're just going to go on a ski trip and you and you don't know if you're going to is something that you're going to be taking out then just borrow gear you don't need to go out and buy stuff um see you know see how your kids take to it that kind of thing and um there was something else that i was going to say oh yeah the, um one other thing that can be quite good if your kids get particularly cold hands and feet and you're finding that's really affecting how long you're going to be spending outdoors. You can actually get those little um, snap things that are quite good for, um, they go into your ski gloves or into your, um, into your socks or into your boots. And um, you just, you buy them and then you, you kind of snap them and they just emit a really, really slow, warm heat um, for about three hours. And you can pop them into kids' boots or into their gloves um, to keep them warm if they seem to get really cold in the extremities, even if they are running around. Yeah. Cool. Um, I'm going to add to that from probably my environmentally friendly aspect. Sheepskin, sheepskin is great to put in the bottom of gumboots um, because gumboots do get really cold. They're not like running shoes, which are a lot more insulated. So putting that or cell phone matting. So, you know, um, the, the cell phone bed mats that you kind of sometimes see for camping, you can kind of cut out a foot pattern, put them in the bottom of a gumboot. And I think especially for the South Island, um, it, it gets just so much colder the further mm. south you go. So just keeping that in mind that if, if children have cold feet and they're outside, that, that will end a session outdoors pretty quick. Um, yeah, mm. it just ends it quick. So get something warm in the bottom of their gumboots. Wool or natural fibres are the best way of keeping children yep. warm, especially against the skin. I think we've briefly touched on this, but I just want to reiterate that because if you put cotton next to a child's skin and they do sweat, that's actually going to keep them cold. Um, but also it doesn't warm up, whereas wool, even if it does get wet or merino and thermals as well, when they get wet, they will keep you warm, even though they are wet. So mm. that's just a really key thing. I always see cotton on children. Um, uh, so just really try that. Again, op shops are great for wool and thermals. You can pick them up pretty cheap. Trade Me is another place I've been, I always search on Trade Me for, for thermals and asking around. Um, if you are a centre or a school, do a call out to your, you know, your Fano or one of your neighbourhood pages and say, hey, has anyone got gumboots um, in these sizes that they're willing to donate? Especially if you're a school or a centre where um, people struggle financially, I think that's a really good way of bringing things in. Or hand me down jackets and thermals and um, even woolen socks. Or contact your local warehouse or um, local store and say hey can, can we get some sponsorship um, I also mm. see a lot of centres and schools starting to apply for funding for clothing so mm. that's a, another thing that schools and centres can do to be able to get um, you know get their children kitted out so that they can stay outside and play um, what else did I have um, I had heaps of tips in my little newsletter can't even remember what else you I did said, but and yeah, I think, a big I think one. Another, one other thing I'll say, just sorry, quickly, person was the hat thing. Um, yeah. I find really thin hats are quite good because when children do get really hot, if it's really thick, they tend to whip it off. But a nice thin merino one, while it might be a little bit cold to start with, it's actually really good when they're playing and they'll often last a bit longer. Right, Kirsten. I was going to say, one of the things you said in your newsletter then was okay. also just about layering. That, ah, that yes. was an important one too to think about what goes first as you see it 
Did you want to speak about that, Celia? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll be real was... quick and then we'll probably have to wrap it up anyway. But so, so layering is yeah. really important. If you have a really big, thick layer, um, you take that off and then you get really cold. So having lots of thinner layers on uh, is mm. much better and it helps you really regulate your temperature or children regulate their temperature easier. So, so think about those layering and the material that is and um, we've touched on sourcing as well. Maybe in the comments, um, share with us, you know, I know we have talked about ethical sourcing, but also someone has to buy it new at some point. So what are some of the maybe New Zealand brands or local brands that you've used that really work for you? So please share those in the comments and then people can have a look at those when they read back through. Um, we are going to have to wrap it up there, but I think we, we've covered a lot of the key things. You know, kids need to be warm as well as adults. Um, oh, we didn't really touch on adults. So just quickly, adults, you're gonna be standing around a lot more, so you're gonna probably need another layer or two if children are playing. Um, you're gonna get a lot colder. Jeans don't work. You also need to have thermals or leggings on or, or something that's actually gonna keep you warm. I always wear in the middle of winter and um, waterproof pants over the top. Um, yeah, every winter. That's what, that's what I wear with gumboots. Uh, and down jackets are fantastic as well. They're nice and puffy, especially if you're a teacher on duty. Um, you know, that's going to keep you nice and warm out there and woolen gloves. So, yeah, I think we've covered most things now there. Last thing we are going to finish off with, I thought um, maybe a 30 second kind of brief, how can people contact you and um, maybe start with Michelle. How can people get in touch with you if they want to connect with you further? Yeah, sure. So um, if there's any, uh, any mums out there who are wanting a little bit more adventure in their lives, um, both for themselves and for their kids, you're welcome to come along and join our free Facebook group. It is such an awesome supportive community. Um, it's called The Outdoorsy Mama. Um, not to be confused with a smaller American one called Outdoorsy Mama. So make sure you put the <laughs> the in front of it. Um, and yeah, we'd love to see you in, in there. You are going to find it just such a treasure trove of information and feel free to ask uh, your own questions about um, any, any trips you might have coming up, um, any cool local places to go in your area that um, are suitable for the ages of your kids. Um, if, if you'd like to um, meet up with any other mums in your area to get together, mountain biking or anything like that um it's yeah it's a it's a really cool um little community that we've got going there so you can find us there um uh you'll also find out more about our paid membership there if you're an auckland mum and um if you just want to email me please feel free at hello at outdoorsy.co.nz Cool, and we've got your website is on the post for this live so um you can check that out or connect through there as well fantastic Kirsten. Cool. Thank you. Cool. So one of my other top tips was that if you're not um, an advocate, but you're totally a smart person, you know that the outdoors is essential for children, you can outsource. So you can outsource to Michelle or to Celia or myself um, so that you can get all these groups going or you go to them or whatever. So what we do uh, for Talking Tree Hill is that you can get in contact with us through our website, which is under my name, Kirsten Simmons. It's just about to change over to Talking Tree Hill. You can also go onto our Facebook page, which is Talking Tree Hill. And you can go to our YouTube channel, which is Talking Tree Hill. So yeah. the, <laughs> there's a trend there. Um, so when you go onto the YouTube uh, channel, for example, we have lots of different activities. Now, they're hilarious, these videos, because myself and my whanau and different contributors from around Waiheke put together these um, beautiful little videos. And we're very excited that we're actually going to be launching ourselves a lot more online. So this is the first cool. taster to that. So in July, we'll be doing that, which is very exciting. And so what will happen then is that the stuff that we do here at Talking Tree Hill, we will put up so that you can try that at home or that you can try it within your schools. So that's gonna have a um, two, two kind of approaches with that. So it's the same channels for us. Look at our website, look at our Facebook page and look at our um, YouTube channel. And some of that will help you. And, if, and it also might help you be the advocate within your school. So if you want to connect with us and uh, we will be coming into schools, uh, you know, out of Waiheke. Well, maybe not quite yet. Maybe not for a year or so, but at some stage, uh, you know, and just email. That would be great. We'd love to hear from you. Thank Fantastic. you.
Thank you, Kirsten. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, obviously, you can connect through my Facebook page. But on our, on our website, we've got a few freebies. So if you just go into the first drop down menu, and I think it's start up, start here, and then there's a freebies page. You can get some freebies there. There's a backyard play freebie. And I think there's also a couple on our homepage as well, especially for parents. Um, and there is also some, some ones for teachers. So just have a wee look around. And if you're interested in starting up your own nature excursion program, there we have a how-to guide, which is in the shop on our page. But otherwise, you know how to connect with me because you've got this link. So um, yeah, <laughs> love, to, love to connect. But hey, just a big thank you both uh, for coming on tonight. We, we always have this, we always kind of get crammed at the end, but um, it was really great to have you here and chatting. And I think lots of value. There's lots of cool comments in the in the comments. And and please do comment. Say, let, let us know what you thought of this. Was this good? Was this helpful? What was helpful? And if you are keen on getting that list, um, if you're not on my newsletter list and you are keen on getting that list that I have written out, I'm happy to email that to you. Just send me an email, celia at littlekiwisnatureplay.com, and I'll just email that out to anyone who responds. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much uh, to thank you both. You, and um, welcome. I'm going to finish recording now. So take care. Thank you, Celia. <laughs>